Uh, we didn't seem to be able to find much on you. We have a clean record. <laughs> that is by design. Yes, <laughs> we guess so. So um, the only tiny bit of information that I managed to find is actually um, that you're a third generation overseas Chinese. I'm not even sure if that's right. But, um, Top of the world. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, so my first question is, um, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. And uh, we just want to know your, like, your yeah. personal story. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I would be happy to do that. I think that, uh, you know, as, as diplomats, what is uh, great about our careers, and I really do encourage you if you ever uh, think about going into the Foreign Service uh, of China, I, I, would, uh, I would encourage you to do that because uh, we have so many opportunities to go overseas. And what's, what's really unique is that, you know, we in the State Department are a collection of personalities. We're almost like a, a cross-section of America. And we go to most all countries around the world. And what we do is... So what, what is great about the career is that um, wherever we go, we take a little bit of each of our sort of background um, to where we're headed. And so my friends from uh, Kansas, my friends Texas, they take a little bit of those states with them wherever they go. And I'm always happy to, to talk to uh, audiences overseas about where I've come from. You're absolutely right. I am third generation uh, Chinese American. Uh, my grandfather, uh, just like uh, I, you've probably heard of Ambassador Locke, uh, our ambassador in Beijing, uh, he is from uh, this tiny village in Guangdong province, or his ancestors came from a tiny village called Taishan. Uh, which is very well known, actually, to Chinese Americans, because at one point, I think through the 1970s, about 80% of Chinese Americans uh, had roots in uh, this, this very small village. And in fact, uh, that's where my grandfather, in fact, my father was born there. Um, and we immigrated to the United States in 1966, although my grandfather came uh, to Chicago uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, but just to, to make things quick, um, I was born uh, in Hong Kong, but raised in New York and in a state in the Midwest uh, called Minnesota. And I entered the uh, State Department after graduating from Columbia University uh, in uh, 1992. So I've been a Foreign Service officer for, uh, this is my 21st year uh, as a diplomat. And I've served mainly in uh, China. Uh, in Beijing, in our embassy in Beijing. I've also served in Korea. I've worked on Southeast Asian affairs. Uh, but I've also, I'm known in the State Department for spending a lot of time working for Secretaries of State. So I worked on uh, the staff of uh, Secretary Albright, uh, Madeleine Albright, um, also Secretary Condoleezza Rice. And most recently, I was uh, Deputy Executive Secretary for Secretary Clinton. And so I got uh, my, um, the distinction there was that I flew hundreds of thousands of miles um, with, you know, sitting next to uh, Secretary Clinton on, a, on her plane. Uh, but uh, even though I flew all those hundreds of thousands of miles, I didn't collect any frequent flyer miles. <laughs> and so that is uh, my only regret uh, working in that assignment because otherwise uh, she is the most terrific, the most generous boss I have ever had, and really a person I admire a great deal in many Americans, too. So um, my classmate here is going to ask you more about working for um, Secretary Clinton. Oh, I'm happy to talk yeah, about but, um, So I'm going to focus on the personal side of you first. So what made you decide to become a Foreign Service Officer? Well, I think it, it started uh, when I was at Columbia. Interestingly enough, when I uh, came into the Foreign Service, it was right after a period well, not just in the State Department, but the U.S. government, when there was not a lot of hiring of, uh, of graduates. Uh, I think we were going through, at that point, some austerity measures, just as uh, we are today, where we're trying to cut down in budgets. And so when I came in, or when I became interested in, in, in being a diplomat, uh, I wasn't sure that there would be any openings. Uh, it is a competitive process to come into our State Department. At that time... Uh, we had about between 15 to 20,000 uh, people taking uh, the Foreign Service examination. And I, the year I came in, I, I think I was one of 60 uh, 
that came in. And so through this kind of filtering process, we finally at the end uh, get the sort of new batch. Um, but the odds are so slim that you would never quit your day job or you would never uh, you know, throw all of your eggs in this basket. Uh, of uh, becoming a diplomat. But I, I did become interested when I was uh, at Columbia, and uh, I met a few uh, diplomats uh, at that time, American and uh, from other countries. And they talked about the, their duties. They talked about uh, the sort of nobility of public service. And that's what really attracted me, and not just the lifestyle of being overseas and and learning about their cultures and their civilizations. Um, but also, I became interested because you know, there is a kind of sacrifice, and there is something that told me that um, the United States afforded us many opportunities, my family especially. And I thought that this was something that, um, that my parents would be proud of, uh, that I had thought enough uh, to um, invest uh, so much of my career, uh, my adulthood, into paying back. And, uh, but I, I really was attracted to uh, uh, the intellectualism of it, uh, foreign policy and, and learning about uh, civilizations overseas. That was really what attracted me. This sounds basic, but what were you studying at Columbia? I was, when I was an undergraduate, I studied uh, comparative literature. Uh, I, was, uh, I was in the uh, English department uh, at the time. Uh, but I went to graduate school. I became interested after meeting a number of uh, people in, who had studied international relations and who would, were practicing uh, you know, careers uh, in foreign relations. And so I studied at the uh, School of International Affairs there. Um, you know it well, for those of you who know Columbia. And I was there for two years specializing in security policy. So uh, studying uh, conventional and uh, unconventional warfare when I was there, but also uh, studying a little bit of Chinese on the side. So, um, so we had Secretary Elaine Chow with us two days ago, and you mentioned Ambassador Gary Locke just now. Um, how do you think your um, Chinese-American identity or your Asian root influenced or impacted your career path, if at all? Um, I, I suppose because I had some background in it, it was natural to gravitate toward East Asia uh, in my career. But our State Department doesn't make assignments in the most sort of uh, logical way. <laughs> we are sent to all areas of the world, all regions of the world to serve. And even though I did have some background in, in Asian studies, I did not fully expect to spend most of my career doing this kind of work or specializing in this area. In fact, I thought I would probably be sent to uh, Africa or South America, places where I have um, some interest, although not expertise. Uh, but I had expected that I would spend uh, at least uh, you know, one or two assignments in those places. It hasn't turned out that way. Um, it was not by design, though. It really was, um, you know, a lot of it's luck uh, and just chance in, in the State Department because it is a competitive process. So many, uh, there are many coveted jobs, and it, it is a competitive process to, to get these onward assignments in the busiest places such as Moscow or, uh, you know, London, Paris, places like that. And I would include Beijing as a coveted post in the State Department because um, we all want to do challenging work. We all want to be around where the action is. And I think that I, I can speak for all of my colleagues in the State Department when I, when I say that. Uh, we are looking for the biggest challenge to uh, confront. And I think today um, China is considered one of the the premier posts that we have, because the work is so exciting, because there's so much happening in China that is interesting to us uh, and to our government, uh, to our people, uh, that uh, it, is, it is a place where many foreign service officers are gravitating to. Um, we, okay, well, one well, last. Thank you for your questions. Yeah. Oh, one, one oh, go, go ahead, please. Yes. So, uh, we do it must be a yes or no question. <laughs> 
<laughs> Unfortunately, it's a little bit longer than that. But oh. we are very interested, like being Chinese American, like in your growing up or in your career, has that ever like posed any cultural conflicts within you? And also, like in bringing your bring up your children, does that play? Do you see like a play of like those different cultural values? Well, in, in this job, what's great is I, I don't. Uh, I, I don't see my children at all, so I don't have to raise them. So <laughs> I don't have to answer that question. No, my, I, we have four children. So uh, my wife was born and raised in Washington, D.C., uh, but she's also a Chinese-American, and she speaks uh, really good Chinese, unlike me. And, uh, in fact, she often tells me not to speak Chinese in public because it's embarrassing for the family. <laughs> no, really. Uh, I, I'm not kidding you. She, we had this conversation the other day, but she... Um, I think what's, what's great uh, for us is we share much of the same background. Even though I wasn't born here, I, you know, our family immigrated when I was uh, about six months old. Um, but my wife was born and raised here. Her father was a, uh, a translator at what they call the Meiguo And so there was a lot of similarity in our background. Our parents spoke Chinese to us we, when we were growing up. And so I think that it has been mainly a positive for me. I, I, I can – Chinese Americans are, are, are sort of funny in the United States because I think your identity uh, comes directly from the, the generation that your parents immigrated to the United States. So, for instance, um, as I just mentioned, most Chinese Americans who came to the United States uh, in the early part of the 20th century were Cantonese or Tai Chinese speaking. That has changed quite a bit over the last few years. Chinese Americans are coming from throughout China. Uh, they're coming from uh, Fujian. They're coming from Beijing. They're coming from Shanghai. Uh, many are coming from Taiwan. And so I think that we, we're all a little bit different in a sense, depending on where our parents came from and depending on which generation uh, they came uh, in. Uh, so I would think it's been mainly a positive um, experience. Certainly when I was growing up, because of my desire to assimilate into uh, American culture, mainstream uh, American culture, um, you know, you're, you're going to face, uh, you know, challenges when you're growing up, but I don't uh, regard those as uh, negative necessarily. I think that, that that is really part of adolescence to uh, overcome uh, the challenges, and that is just one. I, when I was in high school in Minnesota, I really was the only Chinese American in the school. At times, um, you know, it was uncomfortable. Uh, just because you weren't part of the mainstream and you want to be so much uh, a part of you know, the lives of everyone else that you, whom you meet. But also, uh, if you want to be unique, it's not very hard because you are almost by definition uh, unique there. So I, I thought it was uh, overall a positive and it's paid off. In terms of my career advancing, um, yeah, I, it's it's better to ask my colleagues. Uh, to be honest with you, I I, I don't know. I've I've risen um, relatively quickly uh, compared to others of my generation um, in, in the foreign service, but I wouldn't say necessarily that it had to do anything with any kind of unique background, uh, because these days, especially, uh, we are in the State Department, especially, uh, almost colorblind. Our organization is one that is extremely tolerant <laughs> uh, of um, you know, differences just because it's our job to kind of parachute around the world into foreign societies and to function there. And I think that we do recognize that uh, differences are uh, a strength or a strong part of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moy. That was very, very thought-provoking. So um, I think I will start off with something that probably most of us today are curious to know about. Um, what was it like for you to work 
at the State Department for Secretary Clinton on a day-to-day -day basis? I know there's probably not a typical, no such thing as a typical date for you, but... No. Yeah. <laughs> that, well, that's another great feature of, of the Foreign Service career is that no two days are alike. You exactly. do wake up, uh, you know, going to work. Sometimes you have to wake up in the middle of the night uh, because uh, if you're on call, as I often have been over the last few years, um, you know, you could be thrown into a crisis uh, that you hadn't imagined that you would be thrown into the day before. Uh, but working for her, it was kind of like that because uh, working on her staff, you are expected to understand uh, the global situation and what's happening out there. I do remember uh, a couple of years ago being called in the middle of the night after the um, enormous earthquake in Japan and having to uh, run into work uh, that morning to try to assemble a team that would have to uh, help respond uh, to uh, J Japan's needs uh, in those cases. Just as in the case of the earthquake in Sichuan, right. uh, we are awakened sometimes in the middle of the night when things like that happen overseas. Um, and uh, you may have heard uh, last year, right around this time, uh, a, a prominent Chinese uh, citizen um, sought refuge in our embassy in, in Beijing. And that also was kind of a crisis uh, that uh, required some, some quick answers. And so we were thrown into that. But I liked that because it, it, it kept your, your blood pumping, you know. It, it keeps the day interesting. And that's, you know, in, when I was a kid, I always thought that's the kind of job I wanted, not to be a diplomat necessarily, but to, to be in a job that you, you really thought was neat and, and, and cool and that every day was uh, kind of unexpected. And so even though I knew that I was coming in this morning to, to visit with you, I had no idea what you were going to ask. This is all kind of exciting to me. I'm, I'm hoping that you don't ask certain questions. And <laughs> it might be really private, uh, but, uh, but I am, you know, this is, this is kind of a, a fun thing for me to do. And I said this last year, and I meant it quite sincerely. Secretary Clinton believes that it's so important for us to talk to foreign audiences, American audiences especially, to explain what we are doing. We are not a secretive organization. We are very, very open about what we do, and we should be. We are, should be transparent, and we should be talking to people about exactly what we do. If more, especially Americans, understood the role of diplomacy, I think we wouldn't have as many issues with our budgets as we are having uh, today. Now, that's a private you know, comment. That's my private view, not necessarily the U.S. government's view, but I, I really do believe that. And so working with her was just a, a real dream because I got to see so many parts of the world. We went to, I don't know, close to 100 countries that I, uh, on, the, on the trips where I uh, was present. Um, and we were going through sub-Saharan Africa and some of the most interesting spots from, you know, Kinshasa, Goma in the Congo uh, to Liberia, all these different interesting places. And I got a, a chance to, to see... Um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, places where, um, you know, I had no experience in my career. And it was just, a, you know, a thrill. And, and sometimes you could see that it might be dangerous, um, especially in war-torn areas. But really, um, getting to see her up close in how she thinks about issues. And she is a very, very thoughtful person, extremely smart. And what impressed me the most is that she, she has a kind of instinct about policies, that even though she may not have studied an area of the world, she simply understood what was needed in order to help that country, uh, help that country achieve peace or help that country through development. I mean, these were things that were just, I, I don't know where she learned all of this, but I was just amazed because she doesn't have a foreign policy background. And yet she was able to simply, you know, uh, very quickly respond showing excellent judgment. So it was, it was really remarkable. I, I, I thought that was the best part of it, just being up close to her and seeing how her, she processes information, how she devours it, and then how she then comes up with a very thoughtful solution. Oftentimes, just the most imaginative kind of solution that you would not have thought of before. So anyway, I'm a big fan. Uh, as you can tell. And, and I went into the job not knowing her at all. And I am not that political. I am not a, a supporter of one party or the next. I'm not a registered party, uh, Democratic or Republican party member. And I became just, uh, you know, a big, uh, you know, you can tell I'm gushing here, but I, I am a big fan of hers. It was terrific.
Absolutely. Um, and on um, something that's relatively, you know, somewhat related to that, bringing diplomacy back. Mm -hmm. um, we know that Secretary Clinton is known to have put as much emphasis on the so-called hard power in high politics like security as on soft power and low politics such as women's rights. So do you personally have any observations or opinions to share with us on, on that? I, I think she was really prescient in uh, talking about uh, women's empowerment in foreign policy. Absolutely. I think that was one of her main achievements. Uh, I was also involved in, in many of the uh, events or the um, the, the special uh, meetings that she had on those subjects overseas. And, you know, this is not a traditional sort of foreign policy topic. I mean, in fact, some would actually ridicule it because it's, it's not really security or it, it doesn't have to do with nuclear weapons and all those things we think about Something when we think of war. Peace. Yeah, it, exactly. What I thought, when, when I, the more and more I listened to her talk about these issues and the more and more I heard responses from foreign country uh, representatives, the more I understood what she was talking about. Because in the future, um, we need to have uh, a, a broader collection of people representing our countries. And I, I would say that uh, women are uh, very underrepresented not just in foreign policy work, but in government work around the world. And they have proven, uh, women have, have shown, and I don't mean this in, in, a, in a patronizing way, I mean, I mean this quite sincerely, they have shown to be, uh, in a lot of cases, better managers of issues than men, uh, and more thoughtful uh, about issues because they hear, the, the way they process uh, information, I think, is, is so unique. And, um, and so beneficial for all of us. And my guess is, and again, uh, I'm sorry if I'm sounding patronizing, but I think that uh, if we have more women doing foreign policy, we'll have more peace. I agree. <laughs> I, I, th I think that's <laughs> going to be true. So I guess the moral of your story from, you know, a young boy who just thought, you know, being a diplomat was cool to, you know, where you are today, I guess the moral of the story is probably be careful what, what, of what you ask for. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I... I uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty amoral, actually. I don't. I'm not, uh, there's no, I, yeah, there, I guess that's the moral of the story, right? Um, but really, I, you know, when I, when you're young, um, and I count you all as being young, so much is open to you, and I enjoy seeing that in my children. You know, I, I am really jaded. I was thinking about this the other day. I, I, I'm jaded about travel. The last thing I want to do is to get on another plane. I have been on so many planes in my life. But when I see my children and their reaction when I tell them that we're thinking about taking a family trip to, I don't know, California, someplace where we have to fly, they seem so happy. And it seems like such an adventure even to go to an airport. And for us, the airport is the last place where we want to be, really, <laughs> because we spend so many time. Yeah, I have been to Beijing four times in the last six weeks. I, the, the last thing that you know, somebody like me wants to do to go to another lounge to eat the bad peanuts and the, you know, the stale cookies there. Um, but I get excited when I see them. And when you're young, the world just seems so open to you. And I'm lucky because I'm in a job where everything is different. Um, it could be different. Uh, you know, I could be in other lines of work. My parents uh, owned a restaurant for more than 30 years. And you know, the thing about that is, they loved it. They just loved it. They worked seven days a week. They did not take, you know, the last, I think, 15 years, my mom didn't even take a holiday. She just liked, that was just part of her life, and she just, she liked it. And, and I, I kind of admired that. You know, when I was younger, I was thought, oh, geez, restaurant work. I mean, is that, I didn't see myself in that. But she loved it so much that I thought, well, oh, this is, this is great. You know, you grow up and, and you're doing something you want to do. She not just loved the food side of it. She just loved meeting people. <laughs> Came through her door, and she thought she was helping them. She thought uh, to, you know, she became a part of their lives, actually. She had so many nor you know, normal customers built up over time. But uh, you know, I, I, I really do enjoy it, and I, I do hope that you have a chance to, to seek out uh, you know, a dream profession for you, whatever that is. 
And I think that applies to everyone here yeah, as no, well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, we probably have to move on to yeah, bigger yeah. questions that we have for you, but thank you so much for your answer. Yeah. I, will, I will pose some questions. I think many people are very interested. Um, first, a question is about a human rights dialogue. Uh -huh. So I noticed the United States government and the Chinese government had uh, um, 17 sessions of a human rights dialogue. Yeah. But uh, for some scholars, they feel a uh, human rights conflict is unlikely to disappear in a short period. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm curious, do you think if that is effective? And uh, we suppose the situation, if US and the Chinese governments have an opportunity to have a human rights dialogue next time, and you participate, and what aspects do you want to improve? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question, because we are about to enter in another period, into another period where we, we talk about uh, human rights a lot, because the dialogue, the next dialogue, will be coming up later on this year, and uh, we're trying to finalize the timing for that. We're also trying to finalize the timing for our legal experts dialogue, which is a, a unique uh, dialogue in and of itself because it discusses rule of law issues, or it emphasizes rule of law issues as much as it does sort of the traditional kinds of human rights or abuse of, of human rights that uh, we've, we've focused on in, in the past. Um, you're right. I mean, I think a lot of the critics, um, we... We do hear them. We do have a regular conversation with people from NGOs, and we, we do hear the criticisms uh, that we're not getting very far or that it's not productive, uh, that we simply have different ways of approaching these <coughs> issues. And so I, I can appreciate that. But I think over time, uh, the dialogues have gotten uh, more candid. We've exchanged views on a wider array of issues, not just including the rules law, but, but issues that um, are sort of at the core of, of human rights, such as, um, you know, education through labor, uh, these kinds of issues, and, and uh, the, um, the cultivation of, or, or I don't even know what the, the, the term of art for it is now, but it's uh, the organ trafficking, uh, or removing organs from prisoners uh, for the purpose of profiting, uh, for, for the purpose of profit. So these kinds of issues we've touched on as well. So they've, they've grown, they've expanded. Uh, in some cases, they've become more candid as long as uh, the Chinese side uh, decides that it really wants to talk about these issues. Um, in the spirit of candor, I will say that um, sometimes we do have arguments have very heated disagreements over certain aspects of human rights. It is our view, and you can see it in our uh, annual human rights report, that the situation in China is not very good uh, right now. And it hasn't improved uh, to the level that um, other countries around the world had hoped it would improve, especially given the, uh, the growth of China's economy the substantial wealth that exists in China now. So along with that growth, we were hoping, uh, we had expected, uh, that there would be a, a greater expansion of, of freedoms and uh, human rights. Um, but it is something that's still the aspiration, I think, of, of many Chinese. It is still the aspiration of the world to see that China is able to uh, develop in this area. And I'm glad to hear that Chinese officials do acknowledge that there are shortcomings, just as Americans, I suppose, acknowledge we have shortcomings. But I don't think that we mean the same thing when we talk about that. Uh, I think that um, you know there's still room for, for ample growth. And what we want to do is to enter into these dialogues with uh, a more ambitious agenda. We want to talk about more issues uh, that have to do with um, you know freedom of, uh, of expression, talk about uh, specific issues that have to do with the application of laws in China uh, or lack thereof. And so, um, you know, we still have room. We still have plenty of room uh, to, to improve uh, into. And I, I just, um, I, I can't say that in the short term I'm that optimistic that we'll see much change. But uh, we're still going to keep on plugging away because I think that it is um, it continues to be an irritant in our bilateral relationship. And if China really desires um, 
a kind of new type of great power relationship, then this is uh, one issue that they have to come to terms with. Um, we are not necessarily in compatible systems, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't talk about um, human rights issues or flaws that we see in a candid way. We can, we can do that. So, that's a very good question. Okay. Um, last year, so I watched a video and Miss Victoria Newland responded to the issues of Diaoyu Island in Chinese and Senkaku Island in Japanese. Right. But also she said United States government use Senkaku as an official name. So I'm curious, what do you think? Do you think if that is contradictory? Contradictory that we refer to the islands as Senkakus but also do not take a position on the ultimate sovereignty. I don't necessarily think that. I mean, uh, when I speak in front of Chinese audiences, I talk about the Senkakus, but I also refer to the Diaoyu as well because I think it's more easily understood. Um, I think what's important right now, the, you know, for us as, as diplomats, what, what we want to do is to find a way for both sides to mend fences, to find a path toward um, at least management of differences. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm careful in choosing my words because I don't think resolution or resolving the issues between the two sides over that um, you know, disputed uh, territory, I don't think that's realistic. But what I do think is realistic is a dialogue between the two sides where we can manage the differences. That we're able to still, uh, the, the both sides are able to have healthy relations on the outside, healthy, especially healthy economic and trade relations. But also, to a certain extent, agreeing on many of the strategic and security issues um, around the world. Uh, and yet, now not get into some sort of confrontation. I think that's really uh, the importance here. We have recognized, uh, or we have used the Senkakus for a generation. Um, and it is, I think, a remnant of history. And we continue to use that because we do recognize that uh, Japan is, um, uh, or has administrative uh, control uh, over uh, the Senkakus. But I think that when we talk about um, our neutrality, it's really about the ultimate uh, resolution or the ultimate sovereignty. That will be determined down the road when both sides can actually sit down and determine that. Um, but in the, in the short term, our hope is that um, there aren't any miscalculations between both sides that will lead to an escalation and some crises that uh, that would be catastrophic. I mean, that is our, our deep, deep concern. I think that neither side wants that. I don't think China, uh, Japan, uh, either side wants that. But um, it is a possibility because funny things happen. Accidents happen. We all know that. And um, you know, if there is an accident and there's rising nationalism in both countries, making it very difficult you know, to resolve the problems, uh, then we might have an almost uncontrollable Thank you for your question. Um, also, uh, I think uh, mm, many people are maybe very interested, and we know in Chinese and the United States governments have good relationship right now. That um, in history we had a um, very difficult time, like uh, for example, like the um, bombing incident in the Chinese embassy in Yugoslavia in 1999. So. Um, I'm curious, when those difficulties happen, how does your department negotiate or work with other departments in the United States uh, and uh, um, to make the U.S.-China relationship move forward? Yeah. Um, that's a very thoughtful question because that is one of the most important things we do is to coordinate. Uh, we, we call it the interagency process. So uh, we will sit around the table with... Um, people from the Department of Defense, uh, from the office of the Vice President and the National Security Council will have people 
and depending on the issue, sometimes if it's an economic issue, we'll have our, the Department of Treasury, Department of Commerce, uh, U.S. Trade Representative, and these folks are also sitting at the table. But when we enter into something as urgent as that, we'll have very, very senior people, uh, senior officials uh, sitting at the table, and generally we will be sitting behind them as advisors um, because we are the subject matter experts. And we will try to come to agreement on the, the different options. We'll first try to establish what the facts are in, in a case. We'll go through the background, the history of it. And then we will move into um, uh, presentations from each of the various departments on, uh, on our options, what can we do, and offering a unique perspective. So obviously, as, as the State Department, we will offer the diplomatic perspective. You know, what kind of channels can we use working with our Chinese counterparts in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or in Zhongnanhai? How can we work to communicate to help resolve an issue or to... Um, to eliminate misunderstandings, these kinds of uh, uh, goals that we have. So that's, that's really how we do it. I mean, look, uh, we have faced a number of very urgent uh, issues over the years. Uh, I wasn't as closely involved in the, uh, the bombing episode that uh, you just cited, but uh, I, I knew that about the incident very well because I was uh, on the sort of, uh, I was working on the margins of China issues at that time. But I can tell you that um, everyone comes in, everyone who has an equity or everyone who has any kind of responsibilities touching on China or, or any other sort of regional country, they will come to what we call the table. I'm using that metaphorically, but they will come to the meeting where all of this is discussed. And we will go through kind of a comprehensive list of things that we can do to try to make sure that we don't misunderstand that we are getting our, um, our positions, our, our, our perspectives understood by the other side. And so we'll walk through a series of these options. Um, we will explore them, and then we will try to implement that and put that into place. When we meet with the, the Chinese, um, our Chinese uh, dialogue partners, and I'm sure that on the Chinese side, it's very similar to that. So. Uh, it's, it's a process that um, sometimes isn't pretty because we're not always going to agree uh, on, on the way forward. Uh, but remarkably, I have not seen a meeting where uh, at the end everyone still disagrees. I think that in the end we all come to a certain kind of agreement, either through compromise or sometimes certain facts were missing before. And when they're understood, then people's minds uh, change. Certain departments' views might change accordingly. I'm Ray Huading. I'm a PhD candidate, uh, candidate in chemistry. Uh, I'm from Harvard University. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is that uh, in the last several years, Americans have seen a large number of immigrants from Asia, including China. And this number is probably going to be larger in the coming several years. And uh, how do you think this, uh, these immigrants are going to affect uh, American society, American culture, even American ad identity, and most importantly, the American relations between the countries these immigrants are from, especially the ones from Asia that were interested in? I was reading some, uh, some uh, immigration data recently. I can't remember the year, though, when um, this will become true, but I think very near or very uh, soon the United States will be a minority Caucasian or if, if we're not already there. I mean, I, I think that it's very clear that uh, first and second generation uh, Americans will be will make up the, the majority uh, of this country, uh, and I think it will just become a part of what we see America as. I don't think that necessarily it will be seen uh, as a negative, even though there are very robust debates on the speed or the pace of, of immigration in the United States, and this debate is being played out uh, here in Washington um, in our Congress. I don't think that uh, Chinese Americans are a big part of that right now. A lot of it has to do with uh, 
Mexican Americans, uh, folks from other countries. Um, but I, I, I think that over time, people's views in the United States. I mean, we're I, just speaking from my own sort of perspective. I think Americans' views are, are fairly malleable um, in the sense that uh, just in a generation, our views can change on specific issues. If you look at something uh, like the issue of, of gay marriage, uh, if you had asked me you know, 20 years ago, would we see uh, legalized gay marriage in the United States, I, I don't think that I would say that in 2012 or 2013, um, there would be maybe one-fifth or more than one-fifth of American states would have voted to legalize gay marriage. And so, so much of that, though, is not just changing generations, generations getting older, but I also think it has to do with how the mainstream media treats uh, specific issues. And I think as more, the, the more and more we see um, people, you know, Chinese Americans in different fields, um, you know, in the past, maybe they were stereotyped for being scientists or they were, you know, stereotyped as being engineers and, and computer scientists and people like that. I think the more and more we see them as musicians and people who do art, uh, other forms of, of art, uh, the more we see them um, entering politics. Uh, I, w I, I would imagine that we're going to see a change in American perspectives as well, and I think that it will be a positive because it will be seen as just being another very strong immigrant group that contributes to uh, this country. Now, that's, that's my optimistic view of it. Um, so my question is regarding the uh, education exchange between China and the U.S. Yeah. Uh, so these days we see... Um, China has become the number one country for origin of international students in the U.S. How many? Um, that is a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> that's about like 200,000 uh, uh, 200, uh, in last year or 50. Almost. Uh, yeah. About 190, and, um, so he has uh, just sur 000. surpassed India and become yeah. the number one country like two years ago. And at the same time, there are um, uh, more and more U.S. students who um, go to study in China. And then uh, in 2009, uh, President Obama put forward a 100,000 strong initiative to encourage more uh, U.S. students to stay in China. But what interests me the most is that the in initiative also encouraged um, increasing the diversity of study abroad participants. Yeah. Uh, so I want to know uh, how, uh, what do you see as the chief challenge in achieving this goal apart from the funding? Because I know the funding mostly come from the private sector yeah. without uh, federal financial support. Um, so what do you see are key in realizing this initiative? Thank you. I think the Chinese government is already uh, starting to address that uh, issue, and, and we are starting to as well because um, I, I, th I think the, the recruitment process is so critical to this, and we are trying to go to historically black universities. We are, I think the Chinese government has offered thousands of scholarships to help in, in this effort. Um, I think it's important. I think it's important not just to get um, uh, American college students from the inner city, uh, traditionally less represented uh, students in, in China. It's, I don't think it's not only important to get those to um, you know, the Beijings and the Shanghais of the world, I think that what's important is we seek a geographic, uh, you know, a better geographic distribution too, so that we get um, students who are from rural areas. Um, now I think that it's, it's still more the suburban or, or urban student who generally is, is studying Chinese or who travels um, great distances to, um, to study, but um, in, in my view, we have to see that kind of distribution. Um, but, I, you know, we're slowly working at it. I think the scholarships, the recruitment, those are, those are the things that we're trying to do right now. But we're very close, as you probably know, we're closely involved with uh, the 100,000 Strong uh, Initiative. And uh, it is now uh, not a part of the State Department. Earlier it was. Uh, it is a, a foundation now, and it is uh, doing uh, really good work. And we have, I think, what, there were about 20,000 American students studying in China last year. Um, I think that, you know, we aim to double that, you know, fairly soon. And if, you know, my own sort of anecdotal 
uh, you know, well, if, if what I've heard is, is true, there's so much more interest now than there has been uh, in, in previous generations when I travel there. Uh, it's kind of funny story. My, my high school classmate, who I hadn't seen for probably, what, 30 years almost, um, found me. She, in fact, she Googled me. She, she, she found me, and she, she emailed and said, you know, I don't know if you remember me, but I'm, you know, your, your friend from high school. And, by the way, my daughter, who just graduated from high school, is now considering going to Shanghai. She, she doesn't know even one character of Chinese. She's never spoken and never taken it because she's from upstate New York. But she wants, she's been accepted to, uh, in the first class of NYU students. Uh, NYU has established a campus now at, I think, East China Normal, yeah, in, around Shang, in the Shanghai area. But she asked me, is this a smart thing to do? She's really never traveled outside of her backyard. And I told her I, I thought it was the smartest thing she could do, uh, even though... I think the tuition is about 60000 U.S. dollars a year. So, I mean, that's why she was asking me, because this is a substantial investment for them. I mean, they're not super wealthy. Um, but, you know, they could see that down the road this might pay off for her. And I would say there's nothing smarter you can do because she will come back a different person. And I think in a positive way. She will come back as a citizen of the globe, not necessarily just a citizen of the United States. So I, I don't know. We are we are trying to encourage more, and I think that there's so much more interest there anyway. But we're going to get out to the the, the rural areas, and when we whenever we go out to speak, uh, especially in uh, in the smaller universities, the smaller campuses, uh, we are encouraging more graduate students, more undergraduate students, getting out there. What is your expectation from the new type of grid power relationship, which is proposed by us? Uh, but I think both China and U.S. do not clearly know what what it is. So, and what, what do you think it means? What in your in your view? Uh, what is your view of, and what is your expectation? I asked you first. I don't know. I think both China and the U.S. don't clearly know what it is. Yeah. So, what is your? Expectation? I think that you know that that is a problem. I, I don't mean to make light of this. It, it is a problem sometimes in foreign policy when. We talk about things that nobody seems to understand, or we kind of come up with a new catchphrase or a slogan, and nobody seems to understand. I think that um, I'm, I, I don't have any kind of confirmation. Somebody's phone is. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't. I haven't spoken to Chinese um, uh, officials to confirm this, but I, I would imagine that from Chinese, uh, the Chinese perspective, it would mean that we are. Um, our, our relationship is one where it's mutually beneficial, that it is conducted with mutual respect, and that uh, we take into consideration each other's so-called core interests, uh, and that it is a non-zero-sum game. I, I would imagine that these are components of uh, a Chinese um, uh, view of uh, the new type of, of great power relations. I think from our side, we don't use it that often because it's not, it's not something that we really came up with. Uh, I think we're fine with it if China wants um, a, a, a relationship that's defined that way. I think what we would say is that we want a relationship where both sides are contributing to the health of the international community, the world's health. And so when we say that there is no, or actually it's the president who says this, that there's no great problem in the world that can be resolved without cooperation between the United States and China, this is what we mean by a new type of relationship, where we both see that we have to cooperate for the good of the planet, whether that means climate change or nuclear weapons proliferation. Uh, it's all part of a new type of relationship because if China wants to play on the world stage, and it is already playing a big role on the world stage, it should be contributing to the benefit because the international system has really benefited China. It really helps all of us when we are active, good members, uh, members of, uh, in good standing in the international community. But we have to contribute to it. We cannot define our interests very narrowly for our own good. It shouldn't be that way. 
If we are going to benefit from the community, we have to give something back to it. And I think that's what we're talking about. And we are going to try to find areas where we can cooperate for the good of the world, whether it's peace in between Sudan and South Sudan, whether it's peace on the Korean Peninsula and a denuclearized Korean Peninsula. Uh, we are going to try to do that. And I hope that is um, soon what uh, the definition for China is of a new type of relationship, not just based on what China sees uh, as uh, benefiting uh, China, but one that benefits uh, us as well in a non-zero fashion, non-zero sum game uh, uh, fashion, and also benefiting the world. Thank you. Uh, my name uh, is Gu Yang. I'm, from, uh, I'm a recent graduate from NYU Law. And my question is actually kind of related to the previous one. Uh, this year I have attended a seminar or event or, uh, moderated by uh, Professor Andrew Nathan, you might know, and uh, where he invited two professors from Chicago and Princeton to discuss the rise of China, uh, whether it is peaceful or a threat. Uh, one professor argued that uh, since China wants to become a regional center as a first step, uh, China must want to uh, squeeze American influence out of Asia, which would definitely lead to the conflict between China and U.S. You know, in light of the East China Sea issue, chi uh, South China Sea issue, and the strategic rebalancing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what's your opinion on this? Thank you. We asked that, uh, I've heard that question asked so many times, and uh, I think you can see it uh, both ways. Uh, sometimes it depends on what your biases are going into <laughs> this uh, kind of discussion. Um, but I don't even know if uh, China knows uh, necessarily uh, what it's going to be in the end. It really does matter what your intentions are, and I think that the the – the less China is transparent about those intentions, the more others will perceive them in kind of a negative way. But it also can be uh, a positive uh, factor, too. Uh, I think that uh, China could show that it has very positive intentions, that it has uh, goodwill uh, behind its, its actions. But I think maybe... Uh, in the spirit of candor, uh, I, I think that maybe it could do a better job of letting others know, especially China's neighbors know uh, what its intentions are, and that it not only say you know, this in what we call messaging um, to foreign countries, but also showing them that there is that goodwill. Again, I think the region, the Asia-Pacific region, wants China to be a very positive force uh, for peace and stability and for prosperity um, for the region. But until that becomes apparent um, through actions, uh, I think there will be questions. That's just the nature of it. And I'm not picking on China uh, necessarily when I say this. The United States, in our own history, uh, we have had those, especially in our own hemisphere, uh, we've had those who have questioned our intentions and our actions and did we want to be some kind of a hegemon in the region, that sort of thing. That, those are natural questions uh, to ask. And I think through time we have shown uh, an enormous amount of goodwill toward others and that has helped us uh, in our efforts around the world. It's not perfect. Uh, there are places in the world that are, remain unconvinced um, when they look at the United States, and I think we have to do a better job of that. But um, I can tell you, uh, just from my experience and sitting in thousands and thousands of meetings in my career about you know China and, and other you know issues related to Asia, uh, we don't have ill will at all. I've never heard of anyone saying you know we have to do this because we have to contain China or we have we, we think that China's rise is negative, something like that. That doesn't happen in our meetings. My name is uh, Ding Jinglong. I'm from uh, Vanderbilt University studying molecular physiology, uh, which is kind of not relevant to this issue. Yeah. Uh, but I have a question <laughs> that uh, which might be a little bit uh, sensitive. I can't even pronounce that. What is it? It's molecular... <laughs> physiology? Oh, physiology. Ah, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I have a question which might sound a little bit more sensitive. sensitive. Uh, 
uh, fr from yesterday to today, like we hear a lot uh, like about like American is trying to promote its freedom and democracy value around the world, right. such as what they did in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and the color revolution in Eastern Europe. Uh, but from uh, my point of view, that's uh, all of this like uh, promoting democracy and uh, freedom is is based the uh, base based on the American interest. That's American interest is always a priority on the mission of the U.S. government. For example, that uh, during the Iraq, Ir Iran, Iraq war, like uh, American is a strong supporter of Saddam Hussein, who was a back dictator of Iraq, and for oh, for many years that's. Uh, American has American government has been a very strong ally with a lot of dictators in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, Jordan. Yeah. On the other hand, a lot of a lot of democratic leaders, such as uh, uh, the Venezuela's Hugo Chavez and uh, Russian's Vladimir Putin, who who was elected through legitimate election, was considered as backed by the dictators to U.S. government because they do not work towards American interest. So how could you like, justify this issue? In my view, actually, um, they are coinciding interests. And that when we support democracy, uh, certainly it is, um, you know, in, in our interest to do that because we simply believe that democratic regimes are more peaceful and they are, uh, in the long run, more stable and that there is less a chance of, of conflict uh, with neighbors when that kind of, you know, government uh, exists. You know, certainly, especially in the early days of democracy, we recognize that there are going to be rocky times. It's never easy transitioning from one system to another. And, you know, you can see that, um, you know, there are some regimes that rise up. There are some leaders who rise up using their kind of grassroots popularity and that doesn't necessarily um, mean that, you know, we're going to like them as much. But I think that in the end, in the long run, uh, these kinds of dynamics will kind of moderate and that you will have more stable sorts of uh, governments, more stable types of regimes, and they will act peacefully toward one another. And certainly there are going to be exceptions. I mean, I, I look at, say, a country like Mongolia. In the early days, we saw... Uh, violence there at election time. Um, they're now, what, 20 years plus into their uh, democracy. Um, but they, you know, if you ask the people of Mongolia, would they rather have it any other way? Would they have any other way of choosing their leaders or, or um, you know, leaders uh, coming to the top? I think uh, I'm pretty sure that they would say no, that they would prefer to choose their leaders on their own, and this was the best change for them. Uh, again, uh, you're not going to point to perfection every single time. It's not like countries move into democracy and instantly the world has become better. I mean, there are many, many problems in, in all countries, and they all have areas where they can uh, improve. But I would think that uh, if you ask those societies uh, what they would prefer, uh, they would prefer to choose on their own. Um, because that's all we really, we really want anyway. We want to, to be able to determine our future. We want to be able to, you know, if we've accumulated wealth, we want to be able to protect that wealth. And how we, do we do that? Well, we choose people who um, govern. We choose people who will help us protect that wealth. And so I, I think that in, in the end, uh, what is good for us, what we think is good for world peace, coincides with democracy and what's good for those countries. And it's not simply uh, some kind of a Machiavellian uh, action or belief on our part. You know, we're trying to rule this country or that country. Um, I, I think that uh, still democracy, regardless of, of who wins and uh, what their views are uh, in the long run. Uh, this is a positive. Yeah, of course, of course, I'm happy to do it. So, hard things. Are you going back up?